Welcome to the wide world of esports, a show devoted to all things esports. I'm your host, Catherine Noor. Today, my guest is Tom Leonard, the creator and host of Gamers Change Lives podcast. Our topic is esports change makers, lessons from interviewing the experts. Welcome, Tom. Hey, thanks for having me, Catherine. All right, and thank you for substituting as host a number of times. I really appreciate it. Hey, anyone that gives me a chance to talk is like, it, it's, it's on them. All right. So you have a, your podcast, Gamers Change Lives, has been going on for over 60 episodes, I understand. Tell us about it. Yeah, it, we've been doing it for 60, 60 episodes. We have had three seasons. We're getting ready for our fourth season. First season was whoever we can talk to. The second season was um, follow the money. We're talking to investors, talking to sponsors. And season three was more about esports one-on-one, more about business topics out there. So we're, we're getting ready to launch season four. And it's, it's, been, um, it's been great. What, what are you focusing on in season four? What we think we're going to be talking about is uh, we want to talk about accelerators and incubators. Because one of the things that so many esports entrepreneurs, uh, so many entrepreneurs, um, it really in any genre, um, they're always they're always looking for to up their business skills, and there are these kinds of organizations all over the world. We were talking to Cholwe in Zambia, and she was talking about she went to Bongo Hive, and there she she was she has an esports team, her and her partner, and she just learned all these business skills. So we thought let's talk to some people to kind of put it in people's minds that. There are resources out there that can help them out. Sure. Now you have a global reach and you focused your, um, uh, the guests from different regions or different countries. Tell us how you, um, how you, you know, who you allow as guests in terms of regions. What we want to do is, um, I mean, our tagline is, you know, Play games, create jobs, jobs change lives. And what we want to do is we want to talk about how esports can create jobs anywhere in the world. Not so much just in, you know, how it's done here in California, where I am, but really how it can be done anywhere in the world. So we talked to a lot of people in Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, Middle East. We talked to some people in Europe. We talked to people in India. We talked to people in, in Asia as well. Because it's this the same story we keep hearing over and over again is about how esports whether you're creating a team, whether you're creating a tournament, it's like it, it does create jobs. Mm, okay. So what? let's start with your second season because you had a real focus. What was your, remind us of your focus your second season? We, we call it follow the money it, because we okay. wanted to talk to, because the, the thing that we hear, the common thing we hear all the time is I need more money. It's like, you know, any business needs money to be successful. And really in esports, it's sponsorship and for uh, your organization, it may be an investment in your organization to let you continue and to let you grow. So we talked to people who are on the sponsorship side, who were giving sponsorship. We talked to Luca Tukoni, uh, Red Bull South Africa about what, what does he like to hear when someone comes and pitches to get, become a Red Bull sponsor? And it's like, it, he think his, his advice we heard over and over again was, Tell them what you can do for the brand. Don't tell them how great you are, how you have all these followers. It's like, uh, it's, no, what they want to hear, what can, what can you do for them? And if you, if you start the conversation, and, and well, obviously you need to start it beforehand, you need to prepare for it. It's like one of the things that we also learned is um, know who your audience is. So when you go into Red Bull, go into any, any place, and you're, and you're pitching for sponsorship. Make sure that you know who it is that you can bring to the sponsor. So do a little bit of research on who it is that um, yeah, is in your audience out there. When we talk to investment, uh, we talked to a, a couple of investment bankers, a couple of venture capitalists out there, and it was like, what do they look for when they're interested in making an investment? And my impression has always been, if venture capitalists, they're, they're designed to say no. That's, that's, uh, that's what they want. It, it, it's just the opposite. They want to say yes. They want to find an organization that they can invest in and that they can that they can work with. 
And one of the things that we, we discovered there, certainly for on the investment side, is the most important thing is the founders. Are, you know, are they talking to founders that are going to be successful out there? So you know, we just talked to a lot of different people about, um, about money because that's something that everyone needs more of. Sure. So do you find that e the esports business and the show me the money and the business portion, you know, um, those seasons that you focus on that, is it any different than any other segment of business? Yeah, what we want to do is we want to tell the stories of people who have been successful in creating businesses to give other people the idea that, hey, here's a Ronnie Lucigi in um, Nairobi, Kenya. Here's the kinds of things that he's been doing. And the other thing that we find is no one, uh, no one we've talked to has a roadmap. It's like no one is like, okay, here's your roadmap. Here's where you want to go. And here's how you get there. Just the opposite. All these people are out there creating their own roadmap, which is just, uh, just amazing out there. We find that a lot of people uh, in esports, they're, I mean, let's face it, they're playing games. So they could be really good on the game side of things, but on the business side of things, that that's where maybe we can, you know, point them in the direction. We don't have all the answers, but if we can get them to think we've had attorneys, which, which you can, you can appreciate. It's like, okay, why, why should you be talking to an attorney? And when should you be talking to them? Not when you need them, but before you need them sort of thing. So the same kinds of things, any, um, whether you're a team, whether you're a, um, a tournament organizer, it's a small business. Sometimes it's a big business, but it has all the same business um, requirements that anyone else has. You know, HR, accounting, taxes, um, logistics, you know, uh, space. It's like there's all kinds of things. So the more that we can tell the stories of people around the world who have, who have um, been successful at managing these kinds of business activities, uh, we think we're doing the right thing. Sure. And you focus on countries that are not like, you're not focusing on North America. You're not focus, focusing on Europe. Um, do you find that there's a difference between those countries, um, the people in those countries that you are um, talking to um, compared with, you know, the experiences that we have like in North America and in Europe? Yes and no. Because yes, they're playing esports. So if you're playing, if you are, if you have a Mortal Kombat tournament in Ghana, you're dealing with the same thing that someone here in Burbank is, you know, creating their own uh, Mortal Kombat tournament. But there are things that we don't always appreciate here that are challenges. Let's say in Sub-Saharan Africa, it's like infrastructure. It's like you know, are the lights going to be on 24 hours a day? Well, maybe they are, maybe they're not, sort of thing. So that's something you get to work work around. The thing that we work, we talk more about were servers because there aren't servers or there's very few in sub-Saharan Africa. And here it's like, you know, if I logged in to play Fortnite to watch people beat up on me, it's like my, my, my ping rate would be just like everyone else that's, that's in the game. But if you are in sub-Saharan Africa, your ping is going to Europe and back. And it's like, and that, that difference, a difference doesn't, may not sound like a lot, but if you're trying to be a real world champion, like we're talking to uh, Queen Errol in, um, in uh, Nairobi, in Kenya, and for her to play fighting games, it's, it's almost impossible if you're, if you're not on a, the same playing field. So there's, there's some infrastructure requirements. The other thing that we find is it's just amazing how ingenious people are, how creative people are. Because things that we might think, uh, well, I just can't do this if I can't depend on the electricity or the ping rate is bad or anything. No, they figure out ways around it and and benefit from it. Sure, we can relate to the ping rate issue in Hawaii. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we do have that challenge. But, you know, it's worked out in our advantage in some ways because, like, the Overwatch League, they they brought um, championship to um, University of Hawaii because we had favorable... Um, opportunities to connect with Tokyo. So do you feel now that you've interviewed so many people um, across the world in the business of esports, do you feel that you can provide some 
like advice to anyone that is interested in starting a business in esports in Africa or India or the Middle East? Yes, because in, in listening to me talk, no. But when you look at, listen to our guests, if you're trying to start something in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, as an example, you can hear from other people who have done that. And that's really valuable because then they're dealing with the same kinds of issues that you would be dealing with when you create your, um, your team or your tournament out there. So, so our value is in telling other people's stories and not telling people how to do it. So, Tom, how do you get involved in this? Like, what is your background and what did what led you to want to be create and host this podcast? Well, um, I've been in marketing for a long time, mainly entertainment marketing. Uh, Netflix, when they were starting out, uh, Warner Brothers, which is just down the street, got to do uh, some some amazing things there. But then. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was talking to some people in, in sub-Saharan Africa, in Ghana, about doing some tournaments. I said, oh, let's do uh, Mortal Kombat, because I know the WB guys, WB Games guys over here. It's like in Mortal Kombat is an older title, which means that there's more flexibility in, in what, what uh, can be done. So let's do that. And so we started putting things together. And Kwesi Hayford in Ghana, he was like, he was doing all these, this promotion for girls, his term, girls. And I said, what it, well, what's going on there? He goes, well, I want them to make enough money to not have to live on the streets. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow, that's, that's something that we would never, you know, we probably would not be thinking of here. And it, it started to make me think, it's like, okay, what if we could tell stories about how esports can create jobs? Now, we're not talking about being a streamer and being, you know, super famous and everything, you know, that could happen. But, you know, how about if you create an event? What if you create a team? And you can actually start creating jobs. We were talking to Aniola Idan at GamerX in Nigeria. And she um, they were like amazing. It's like they put on this huge event, multi, multi-country multi event in like seven or eight months. They put it together. And when we were talking with her, she was talking about how, yeah, she was adding in about 270 jobs were created for that event. So it's like, you know, th there's the opportunity out there to 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 make some money that can can make a difference in someone's life. And how do you get guests? Yes, yes. I, I, I tell the story all the time. It's like the way that to get guests is you hire someone, you become a business partner, I, not just hire, but become a business partner with someone like Reginald Nsawa in Ghana. And when you're starting a podcast, one thing that you don't have is a track record. So when you go out and you try to get guests, it's like they're like, well, but you, you don't, you know, you, you haven't been at this very long. But the, the way, the reason that Reginald was successful is he just asked. And he was out there asking people. We were talking to people we had no business talking to. I mean, just at it, a it, it really high level. But the way that he got it was, you know, to be sincere, but to just ask people. Because more often than not, people, people like to talk about themselves. People like to talk about what they're doing. And at the same time, it, people like in, uh, people in North America or people in Europe, we were bringing them a, a world that they weren't that familiar with in so many different places. They just didn't have the same. And some, sometimes we made connections because they were like, oh, I really would like to work more with people in South Africa, but I don't know anyone in South Africa. And you're, we're like, well, we, we, can, uh, we can help you do that. So it's, it's uh, you know, a lot of those connections are, um, are, are part of the story. The other thing I always tell people is if you want to, if everyone should have a podcast, because what it, what it does for you, it allows you to network. It's like, you know, you know, you can have a great resume and everything and you're out on LinkedIn and you're like, oh, I'd like to talk to this person. But, you know, it's kind of an awkward, you know, I'd like to talk to you kind of thing. If you have a podcast, boom, it's like an in to, um, you know, and not necessarily that you're saying, hey, I want you to be on a podcast, but hey, it gives you some credibility, some your authority that I know I've heard you talk about with your show. It gives you credibility out there that, um, that maybe you, you know, you, might know what, what it is that you're doing. Yeah. Now um, that I've had over a hundred shows, I've met so many people um, in the world of esports all over the world. So I feel like um, I can go to um, an event and maybe one of my guests will be there. Uh, you know, so it is a great way to uh, infiltrate 
um, the space. Now, are you a, are you a gamer or have you been a gamer, Tom? I I'm, I like playing games, but not really competitive games because I'm so bad at it. Like I'll play I'll play uh, PUBG or something like that, and, and I always I always buy the like the, the bright orange outfit, which was like a bullseye targeting me. You know, it's like so I was always out pretty soon there. But I, I like the, the games like Assassin's Creed and um, th th those kinds of games. You know, Far Cry, and so I played those a lot. But I also worked with the WB Games people over here at Warner Brothers, and it was interesting to see how they were um, approaching marketing games there so i've been i've been a gamer but you know not anything yet uh too serious now you have been really focused on other countries like international um gaming and esports how would you compare the united states to what's going on um in these other countries it's here it's like um an industry on steroids compared to other places. They're, it, it's always interesting because they're doing the exact same things. They're, they're, they're creating the events. They're, they're creating teams, things like that. Same things that you're doing here. But here, the world is so much more robust. So, you know, if you're in California, you're, you're, you're going to be able to find events. You're going to be able to connect with people that you can actually meet up with. If you're in uh, someplace in Zambia, you know, you're not not going to have that same ability to network with people um, that are are nearby. So that's one of the things we want to kind of do with the podcast is to give people an idea of, hey, there are other people doing exactly what you're doing in places that are just like where you're from. Do you have some shows in your mind that stand out to be kind of the most interesting or your favorites? Well, I, I would never say that one 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 guest is a favorite over another, but the one that always comes to my mind is when uh, we're talking to Quasi Hayford. He took his team from Ghana to an international event in Bali, and he so we had him after he returned. We had him and all the guys that went to Bali on on the show, and it was great. It was, it was great for a for a podcast host because you just turned it on and let him go, and the kinds of things that you heard were just it's like. And they kept saying it over and over. It was a life-changing event. And each one of them w had a different uh, point of view. But just when you just start to hear what it meant to them. The other thing that was always interesting was their families. Because, you know, they were, you know, they're gamers. And there's always, the, you know, gaming is a waste of time sort of, uh, of uh, idea that, that people anywhere, uh, kids anywhere might hear. But as soon as they went to the airport, and their parents saw they were going to get on a plane, go halfway around the world to play video games. It's like all of a sudden it had a whole different credibility uh, uh, it, it, to them and what it is that they were doing. So that that was a great one. We also talked to Nick um, Nick Turner in the UK and, and his team Control that um, has a, a really interesting story there. I mean, the people that we yeah, so many people that we talked to were uh, um, really interesting in, the, in their own way. And so uh, we also tried to, uh, we thought it was important to t t talk to as many women as possible because we want to show that, it, that, that there is a place for women in this industry. And I mentioned Eniola Idan in Nigeria, but we also talked to uh, Denise Chantel Ortega from Women in Games Asia at the time. It's like, so to hear from women and how their journey in esports is really different than a lot of guys. And for them to be able to tell their story and maybe other women hear that, 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 that was a bonus there. Sure. Yeah, I've had a few um, of those type of shows before, and those have been very interesting and, and helpful um, to address the diversity issue. Now, you have hosted um, my show before, The Wide World of Esports, and, and your show is... Um, an audio podcast. What do you feel is the difference when you're um, hosting um, a video versus audio podcast? Video is really important and we need to be doing more of it. We do LinkedIn Lives where we're starting to do, we've had a third one today. And so we've been, um, and to be able to be on video just is a whole different step. 
um, because uh, in talking to people, and we we do record in we record in audio and video. So we use the video on our um, you know if there's marketing or things like this, or we'll put it out on the YouTube channel. But um, but also what we find in a lot of places in the world, uh, video chews up a lot of bandwidth. Mm-hmm. So it, you might you know uh, also people don't download podcasts; they listen to them, they stream them because it's a different. Um, uh, bandwidth it, it uses a different amount of data which which here it's like you know we never think of i mean you download or not it's like okay there's room on your phone it's like but in in some places that type that makes a big difference out there so yeah we'd like to do more video but you know but podcasting is audio and so we're you know we're trying to meet, make it as interesting as we can sure and you know what's interesting about video and i'll show a couple images here is some of my most memorable shows have really interesting um, kind of like at least the thumbnails for the episode are incredibly interesting. Um, I, I have to say I have a favorite show and that's the one where I interviewed Whale Shark. We'll bring the image up. Uh, Whale Shark only appears by Avatar and and he only goes by a pseudonym Whale Shark. OK, and I never knew who he was. His public relations person contacted me and that's how I ended up booking him on the show. And then there's Hip Hop Gamer and that, you know, he created some great visuals and he did some, you know, kind of rap on the show. It was really a cool show. Um, and then Esports Circus um, where Jeff Jeffrey wore a top hat. I mean, these kind of visuals they're really striking. And those happen to be some of my favorite shows just because they were something different. And, you know, I know on the audio, you can't quite create that, but, um, but LinkedIn Live does provide that opportunity when it's great to be um, a guest on your LinkedIn Live right before we film this. So hey, we appreciate it. Yeah. So, um, Tell us how how many LinkedIn Live episodes have you done, or what are you doing with we've, them? We've done three so far. Today's was the third one, and we we want to do them kind of on an every other week basis because the other thing is that LinkedIn Live allows us to do is to talk to people that are kind of one offs. It's like you know maybe if we have a theme for the show, for the season, it's like well we don't want yeah you know, too many people to to um to you know um vary from that. So LinkedIn Live gives us a, another opportunity. And we're, and we're also kind of figuring out what, what it is that attracts people's attention. The other thing that um, I've been a really big fan of, and we've had a few guests, is to have people that aren't esports people online, but that have a message that could be interesting to esports entrepreneurs. We've had a couple of uh, Stanford professors, um, for example, using the Stanford connection as much as I can. And, you know, talking about communication, talking about idea flow, we had uh, Patricia Ryan Manson, who is uh, really a world leader in improv. And she teaches, she has taught, she's retired now, but she, she has taught improv for business purposes for decades. And it's like, you know, she, she's not a, a gamer out there, but it, it, her, the, the message that she had is something that an esports entrepreneur could uh, recognize as being valuable. You know, I think that that's smart that you um, bring in people who can help people in the esports industry. I know this morning we talked about how, and I think we we've talked on the show a bit about how esports is a business, and you need to acquire business skills um, in order to uh, do it. And you know, it it isn't that different from other businesses in in that regard. The ecosystem is huge. So one thing that I've noticed on my show is I've had a lot of people in the education um, realm of esports on. In fact, it got to the point where I had so many that I was trying not to have them as guests because I wanted to diversify a bit. Um, Have you had educators and uh, people involved in the education piece? Yes. Yes, we have, because there are a lot of people out there that are doing some some really amazing things in that space. And it, it, again, if we could talk about what someone's doing in um, Canada or uh, Norway or something like that and have someone in, in in Africa realize that, oh, 
educators can be involved in this space in a positive way. That's a good thing. Sure, sure. So tell us about how we can find your podcast and um, how people can tune in, like when it is, and because I'm sure a lot of people will want to uh, find you. Go out and find Gamers Change Lives um, uh, anywhere, and, and you can probably find us. We're on all the platforms out there because it's really easy to distribute that way. Subscribe, and the best thing to do is to leave us a review. Leave, leave us a positive review. It's actually the best thing. But reviews are unbelievably important in the podcast ecosystem. So go out there. We uh, usually publish on uh, Saturday morning, my time, uh, on a weekly basis. But uh, yeah, we're going to be starting up with season four here very, very soon. And so we'll start to have some new episodes coming out. So just go to gamerschangelivespodcast.com. And so your time is um, Pacific time then? Yes. Yes. Okay. Fantastic. So what's the future of of your podcast. We want to keep telling stories. <clears throat> One of the great things is we kind of figured out as we go along, but we kind of figure out what the audience is interested in. And so, um, yeah, we're just going to, you know, for the, for the future, we're, we're going to be doing more LinkedIn lives. We're going to be doing, you know, maybe Facebook lives, maybe Twitter, maybe, um, Instagram and so on out there to see, you know, see, see where we can spread the message out there. But for the foreseeable future, we're going to keep doing what we're doing right now. Sure. And I, you know, I think it's important to tell the stories of people in uh, Africa and Asia. Um, you know, th these are stories that we might not be able to get in other places. Exactly. Exactly. Well, Tom, thank you so much for being my guest today. Sure. Um, I thank our viewers today for joining us. Um, in two weeks, my guest will be Micah Medeiros. We're going to be discussing an upcoming LAN event at Hawaii Pacific, Pacific University Arena. See you then.